We're very fortunate to have Hannah Knutson, known Hannah for quite a while when she was just a young thing working with Paul um, Roman at the University of Georgia mm -hmm. in their National Study of Treatment. And she's gone on now to the University of Kentucky, uh, Associate Professor in the uh, Department of uh, Behavioral Science, um, with a really beautiful career about helping everybody understand how policy and financing actually causes rather significant changes in treatment availability and access and utilization. So uh, it's great uh, pleasure. This is the TRI group. And um, so uh, please welcome Hannah Kinnick. Mm -hmm. For the invitation to come, um, Tom has been a mentor since I was a graduate student. And so um, it's really nice to actually get this opportunity before you move on into the next phase. Um, and before I get started, I, I just want to acknowledge briefly our funding, which has come from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, as well as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. In terms of a roadmap for my presentation today, I'm going to spend a bit of time setting some context about substance abuse treatment. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but I feel like sometimes the thinking about systems and organizations kind of takes just a moment. Um, and then I'm going to move into some descriptive data about the availability of evidence-based practices and then move into some of the research we've been doing looking at organizational and state policy factors that are related to the availability specifically of medications for treating addiction. And then I'm going to wrap up um, talking a bit about implementation of pharmacotherapy. So we're probably all familiar with these kind of data. Um, we, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health um, pretty consistently shows that about between 8 and 9 percent of Americans will have a past year diagnosis of substance abuse or dependence. That translates to about 22 million Americans and the bulk of them, the majority, about two-thirds of those diagnoses are for alcohol use disorders and then the remaining 7 percent or so are divided across drug dependence um, and then combined alcohol and drug use disorders. So there's a sizable population, obviously, of folks who have substance use disorders, and we've probably all seen these statistics as well, that only about one in 10 people who have a diagnosis will actually get specialty substance abuse treatment in the past year. In terms of, there's that challenge, there's sort of the getting to treatment challenge. But the other challenge, I think, it has to do with these data about discharges from the people who actually make it into treatment that if these are treatment episode data set data, that when you look at discharges, about 44% of folks are those who have completed treatment. And we might even think about the transfers as at least they're still engaged in treatment. So I'm gonna put that in the, in the positive category. But that still leaves about 40% of folks who leave treatment either on their own or the treatment center discharges them. Um, the other reasons encapsulates things like incarceration um, mortality and, and so forth. So we've got both challenges in terms of people getting into treatment and then we also have challenges with folks staying in treatment. And so at a very basic level, you know, why do we care about evidence-based practices? Y'all know. I mean, it's about the fact that that's a mechanism to improve outcomes. It's ways to improve engagement in treatment, retention in treatment, completion of treatment, and then longer-term recovery. So about 15 years ago, um, the Institute of Medicine published their seminal report about bridging the gap between practice and research. And they really, I think this report was sort of a landmark moment for the field in terms of it documenting the notable gaps between what was going on in the research labs across university campuses and research institutes like TRI, and then what was actually happening in the trenches and in the, in the broader treatment community. And so, I mean, the general thrust of this volume was that we've got a very slow diffusion of research findings and evidence-based treatment practices and actually moving those into systems of care. And so my, the purpose really of my talk today is to kind of continue to grapple with this gap and talk about the extent to which it still persists. And a spoiler alert, it's still there. But, <laughs> but I also think we, can, we should probably, as a field, take just a moment to step back because it's really easy for us to feel terrible about how slow the research to practice transition is. But this, these are articles that are about general healthcare. Like we are not unique in the fact that it takes a considerable amount of time to go from applied 
um, science to reaching actual patients. And so, you know, I think we're part of a broader discussion actually about how to disseminate and implement um, high quality practices across the health system. So let's just talk for a brief moment about treatment in the United States. I think we use the word system, I use it all the time. It's, that's maybe not the best term because what we really have, I think, is more, we could think of it as a patchwork. There are all kinds of organizations that are involved in this. We've got corrections that are um, delivering substance abuse treatment. The VA system delivers a lot of treatment in this country. We've got therapists who are in private practice. We have office-based physicians who are doing treatment. We have self-help groups that are helping millions of Americans the opioid treatment system, and then the specialty treatment programs. And this is gonna be the focus of my talk today, are really um, organizations that historically have de delivered psychosocial treatment to their, to their clients. Um, but what's, you know, when we talk about the system, it's important to remember there is no real central authority. There's no big system of regulation over particularly this sector. Um, and as such, it ends up being a place, a part of the treatment system where there's a lot of variability about what goes on. And we can see it simply in a variety of the kinds of organizational characteristics of these. Um, and part of why I'm interested as a sociologist in looking at addiction treatment in the United States is precisely because there is so much variability. And sociologists, we love variation because that helps us explain stuff. So, you know, we've got some organizations that are embedded in mainstream healthcare settings. There are still some, not a lot, but some that are based in hospitals um, or state psychiatric hospitals, community me mental health centers, things that I would consider kind of a little more health medical, if you will. But quite frankly, most of the specialty organizations that I'm gonna be talking about today are not embedded in those systems. Most of them are nonprofits. Um, some of them have ties to larger social service agencies, things like Salvation Army and so forth. Um, but many of them specialize in addiction treatment and that's the primary service um, delivery that they deliver. And then there's a, there's a percentage still that operate as for-profits and kind of corporate chains of treatment, although those have decreased over time. Um, and then there's additional sources of variability that we can think about. We can think about who owns these programs. So some are still operated by cities, city governments, county governments, state government. But they're, they're a minority. Where we see incredible variability, and I'll show you some slides later to this effect, are in terms of how these organizations survive financially. Um, it's fairly rare to see some organization that can make it just on one kind of funding. So they end up being this hodgepodge. They're drawing dollars from the, from the federal block grants that's administered by the states, and they maybe have additional state contracts, and they're trying to partner with criminal justice to deliver some services to folks under community supervision. They may or may not accept Medicaid, um, and they may or may not accept um, private insurance, and then there's still some organizations that primarily rely on cash payments from patients. So there's lots of variability there. And then just to add an additional layer, why not be a little more complicated? Um, the workforce is really diverse across organizations as well. Um, if you had looked probably 30 years ago, you would have predominantly seen that counselors, they were individuals in recovery, and they were drawing upon their experience um, in, their, in their professional lives. And they still make up a sizable percentage of counselors. But we've also seen sort of the rise of folks who are professionally trained, um, they have a master's degree, things along those lines. And as you'll see later, there's quite a bit of variation in terms of if and how organizations um, employ or contract with physicians. So in the broadest sense, uh, my research has been focused on three big questions. Certainly, sort of the epidemiological approach of just how much, how much evidence-based practices, are, how much are they being adopted and available out there? But then I'm really interested as a sociologist in what types of organizations are more likely or less likely to offer evidence-based practices. And then I think increasingly we care about the state context and how does the overarching systems of policies within states and what they choose to do, how does that interplay as well? <laughs> 
So as, I, as I've said before, organizations here are the focus of our work. Um, and the data you're going to see today are from the National Treatment Center study. Um, most, some of the studies um, have been under my direction, some under Paul Roman at the University of Georgia. What's fairly consistent across these various studies is that typically we're drawing upon nationally representative random samples of programs. Um, and we use a criteria that they have to offer at least um, level one outpatient care, but in reality, there's a mixture of things that are going on in these organizations. So some are offering a combination of inpatient or residential plus outpatient levels of care, some are outpatient only, um, and we still have some that only offer residential treatment. Um, all of the organizations today are open to the general public, which means um, we don't have samples of VA facilities. We don't have programs that are located in corrections. Um, the exception to the nationally representative random sample is I'm gonna, I am going to show you some data from NIDA's Clinical Trials Network, um, which is national in scope, but those are all um, organizations that have intentionally partnered with universities. So they don't consist of a random sample, but they are national in scope. And our core methodology is to rely upon administrators and clinical directors as key informants about the organizations um, in which we're interested. And we use a variety of data collection approaches. Um, some of the studies rely on face-to-face -face interviews. Um, and then some of the data you'll see today, we've used a hybrid design where uh, we used mailed surveys first. And if that was successful, we claimed victory. <laughs> and if that was unsuccessful, then we followed up with folks um, via telephone to complete interviews um, there. But before I get too far down uh, the pike here, I think there's three key terms to orient you to um, that will help make everything make more sense. So the first, when I talk about availability, here I'm talking about cross-sectional data about essentially, you know, what are treatment programs doing at a single point in time? I want to contrast that to adoption, which is where we take longitudinal data to look at change over time. And primarily we're interested in the transition from non-use of an evidence-based practice to actually using it within the organization. And then Finally, the last piece, the piece that I think we're still grappling a lot with, is the implementation piece. And that's about how, how many patients or what percentage of patients are actually receiving an evidence-based practice at a given point in time. And for the implementation, I'm going to use um, pharmacotherapy for opioid use disorders as an example. So in terms of what does the landscape look like? So in terms of psychosocial interventions, there are probably folks in this room that know way more about it than I do. But <laughs> really briefly, um, you know, there's been a lot of research done in terms of motivational interviewing, motivational enhancement therapy, where the counselor's role is really to sort of work with the patient. They're empathetic. They help the patient kind of see that discrepancy between the life they want to lead and how their drug use is getting in the way of that. Um, and they're really building and supporting that self-efficacy within the patient. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy has also been a subject of a lot of research and has a, a solid research base behind it. And here the emphasis is on really focusing on skill building and addressing sort of maladaptive cognitions and behaviors. An intervention that's quite a bit different, contingency management, other folks have called it motivational incentives, voucher-based reinforcement is drawing on sort of the classic behavioral kind of model of providing rewards when folks demonstrate a behavior that can be somehow objectively measured. So here we've seen lots of work done about providing vouchers or small prizes in, um, to reinforce clean drug tests or folks coming to therapy sessions and things along those lines. And I think it's useful to note, you know, there is a plethora of information out there that's pretty freely available at this point. You know, NIDA's got sections with all the PDFs of all the manuals you could ever dream of having. Um, the Addiction Technology Transfer Centers have more resources on their websites, um, and they'll do some technical assistance, and they offer trainings and things along those lines. So how much are those three, how available are those three psychosocial interventions? So these are data, fairly recent data, from 2011 to 2012, from about 370 treatment programs from one of our national samples. Um, and here we asked administrators, is the intervention used at your organization? And if they said yes, then we asked how many counselors have been trained in that intervention. And so 
to be represented on a bar here, they have to have at least one counselor trained and be using it at the organization. And so for motivational enhancement therapy and contingency management, only about one in five centers are using those interventions. Cognitive behavioral therapy has gained more traction. Um, Tom is shaking his head. <laughs> Um, so it helps to, to put on that, has, is anybody trained? Because yeah. you start much higher. Oh, yeah. People are like, oh, yeah, we use it. And then it's like, okay, so how many people have been trained? And that will cut probably about 20 percentage points or so off of that rate. Um, so I tried to be a little bit conservative. Um, and then, you know, we've got now an increasing array of medications to treat uh, to treat opioid use disorders and alcohol use disorders. And I know there's been some discussion in the field about this notion of calling it medication-assisted treatment. I feel like for the context of specialty treatment organizations, that label still fits because they're really looking at pharmacotherapy as an adjunct to everything else they do. And we've actually started asking some qualitative questions about, you know, that very question, like, is it just folks come in and get their meds and go on their way? And the answer is no. They're doing all the rest of their services with these people and adding um, medications with that. Um, and we can think about the medication piece as really almost a continuum of regulation at this point. So at one end of the spectrum, methadone is highly regulated. You have to be an accredited, accredited opioid treatment program to dispense it. Somewhere in the middle is buprenorphine because the physician still has to go at least get the X license and like tell the DEA that we're gonna do this and we meet some criteria in order to do this. And then, you know, the medications like acamprosate and disulfiram and naltrexone don't really have any additional um, regulations other than you gotta be a doctor, so. Um, so let's start with availability. And here I'm focused on a sample of publicly funded substance abuse treatment programs. What does that mean? Um, we define that actually in terms of their funding, not their ownership. And so in essence, we're looking at organizations that get at least more than half of their money from things like the block grant, state contracts, criminal justice funds, um, and uh, county contracts. You will notice that Medicaid is not on that list. That is a historical decision that partly has to do with the fact that Medicaid you know, is, is attached to the person as opposed to these sorts of arrangements that are about purchasing sort of blocks of services for folks. And so conceptually, we actually think um, that programs that are gonna rely on Medicaid have to be kind of entrepreneurial because they've got to be able to find a way to reach those patients to come into treatment as opposed to this arrangement. And Part of why I think the, the, the publicly funded sector is significant is that um, they continue to deliver the majority of substance abuse treatment services in the U.S. And so these questions will look very similar to the overarching ones. We wanted to look at to what extent is me are medications available and then what sorts of factors are associated with greater odds of availability. And here we looked at organizational characteristics, things like ownership and are they in a hospital, what kind of treatment services and who do they employ, as well as some perceptions about the state environment. And this was the first time that we started to collect those kind of data. So we started with an earlier cohort of organizations that had been recruited about five years earlier. And in 2009 and 2010, we contacted them all by phone to make sure they were still there. Are you still there? Um, actually, only 27 had closed over that amount of time, which kind of was a little bit surprising to me. Um, and as I said earlier, we mailed the survey to the administrators. And then for those folks that didn't want to respond to the paper form, we started to call and call and call some more until we reached an 86% response rate. And so here are data about the availability of medications within these 250 programs. At the top, this 37% means that a sensor uses at least one of these six. Um, in part, and this is gonna be the, the primary outcome that I'm gonna spend some time talking about, in part because when we've looked at correlations within these six, um, it really seems to be that a crucial threshold is an organization getting over the hump of to that first medication. And then you start to see some pretty sizable correlations among the individual medications. 
And so, you know, we've got 37% that offer anything in the realm of medication-assisted treatment. And then, as you might expect, specific rates are lower. So where, you know, what kinds of organizations were offering medication-assisted treatment? I want to orient you really quickly because I've used this layout on a fair number of slides. That on the left, I've got descriptive sample characteristics. So you get a sense of kind of how prevalent these kinds of organizations are. And then on the right are the multivariate models. So in, in this sample of publicly funded programs, about half are accredited. Only one in five offers detoxification. Um, they employ half a physician on average, which really means there are a lot that, op that employ none. Um, and then almost very close to one physician, at least via contract. And the average is about 1.6 nurses on staff. But the larger standard deviation there kind of tells you there's a fair number of zeros as well. And then you've got some centers that have um, a good number of nurses on staff. And so what we found was that uh, medication-assisted treatment was more likely to be available in those that were accredited, that offered detox, and then those that had more medical staff, which is not surprising. I mean, you've got to have those folks in order to do this. Um, but you'll see, you know, oh, don't do it there. Uh, you know, an almost threefold increase in the odds um, for each additional physician on staff, almost doubling for each additional physician on contract, and then about 1.5 increase in odds for each additional nurse. As I mentioned earlier, we also asked some questions about the administrator's perceptions about the state context in which their, in which their organization was located. So one way we approached this was we asked administrators to respond to some um, attitudinal questions, some Likert items. We asked, you know, um, to what extent is the single state agency in your state supportive of MAT, has adequately disseminated information, and has offered sufficient training? And, that, and that those responses range from zero to four. So when you look at this mean of 2.3, you're just north of the neither agree nor disagree, but not quite yet to agree. Um, but we did actually find that this measure um, was positively associated with um, MAT availability. And the odds ratio, which is now behind the podium, <laughs> is 2.3. So for each additional unit increase on that 0 to 4 scale, um, about doubles the odds of, uh, that MAT is available in that organization. In addition, we asked about some state policies. And here, I'm really glad that we included the don't know category, because I was really struck by how many folks could not answer the question, are there any medications on your Medicaid formulary? Can you use state contract funding to pay for MAT? Um, and because we constructed this as an awareness kind of measure, we ultimately analyzed the no's and the don't know's. We put those, collapsed those together. Um, and then the yeses stood alone. We used both of those items to create this typology, which is to the right. So this half is the unaware or the, state the states do not have any medications on the Medicaid formulary, and we can't use our state contract dollars to do, to do MAT. And then across the other three sections of the pie, they're not quite the same, but um, up here 18% said, yes, we have medications on the Medicaid formulary, and yes, we can use our state um, contract funding to pay for MAT. Um, here is Medicaid alone, about 19% of centers, and then 11% said we can use our state contract funding for MAT, but we either don't know or the, there are no medications on the formulary. So some kind of interesting findings just there. And so we use the, that typology then to look at, to compare that neither group, our 50% of centers to everybody else. And we found that really the Medicaid part is what is associated with availability, that you saw almost a fourfold difference in odds for that both category, and then a three, an odds ratio of three for the Medicaid formulary, but not the state contract funding. The state contract funding alone was not significant in our models. So to summarize here, you know, we've got 37% of centers that are offering some type of medication-assisted treatment. And in terms of the organization, obviously, the medicalized kind of approach, having those staff there, and detox, which obviously also requires um, some medical, medical intervention, 
um, were associated with MAT. And, then, and that also that the state context mattered. What I didn't show you was the non-significant stuff because we've, we've got to get going. But we did actually look at 12-step orientation because there's lots of discussion in the field that that is a barrier to offering MAT. And what you will see here and in the next study that I'm going to show you is that that measure is not significantly associated with MAT availability. So let's talk about adoption. In the last set of slides, we we're just looking at a single snapshot in time. And here we're going to move into longitudinal data. And partly why we wanted to do this was um, and I'm guilty of this. I've you know, published papers using that snapshot data. Um, it's fast. It's easy. Um, but that's really getting at the availability question, not sort of the transition over time. And so here, and, and really when you look at the existing literature, there's a little bit of research that's got longitudinal data about specific medications. Um, buprenorphine got, has gotten some attention, certainly, because it has it came on onto the market since the IOM report, and folks wanted to look at its diffusion over time. Here, um, we were interested in looking at that transition point, and then again looking at the organizational kinds of characteristics um, and whether they were associated with adoption over time. So here we've linked the original baseline on-site interviews from 2004 to 2006 with the follow-up that I just described. And here, the organizational characteristics were actually measured at baseline, and then we've got the adoption data about five years later. So we started with 250 programs that we had data for both. I'm going to focus on the 190 programs that at baseline offered no medications. And let's see what happened. Any guesses what happened? Thoughts, comments? Oh, the room gets quiet. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's going to be a theme. <laughs> so, so we found that about 23% of programs over this five-year period. Um, so that, uh, still there. <laughs> The gap remains. Um, so what did they adopt? Um, you know, buprenorphine was the most adopted at about 13% of these centers, um, and then lower rates for some of the others. Um, you know, Depot and Naltrexone had just kind of come onto the market in a year or two before these, the follow-up data were collected. So we started with looking at our organizational structure variables, and they were not significant. And then, like I, like I mentioned before, you know, we, we are interested in what sort of the treatment philosophy. So we had two questions. We asked, you know, is your program based on a 12-step model? And about 54% said yes. I think that's actually quite notable because when folks started doing treatment center research, uh, I think the first wave of Paul's studies was back in the early 90s, you found a rate much closer to about 80 to 85%. And we talked about how these centers were isomorphic and everybody did the same thing. Uh, we also asked a question about their a broader emphasis on spirituality, thinking that that also could be a potential barrier. Um, and this is measured on a zero to five scale. So you see a 3.5 is kind of somewhere in the middle-ish about the spirituality. Neither of those measures were associated with adoption over time. We also looked at sort of what levels of care were available within the organization. Um, about 40% were outpatient only, about 23% only offered either inpatient or res longer term residential treatment. And then about a third offered, I guess, what you might consider more of this continuum ranging from outpatient to inpatient or residential. And we used the outpatient group as our reference category and did find that this mixed group, um, the folks that offer a broader range of intensities of treatment, were about two point times more likely to adopt um, MAT over time than the outpatient only group. We also looked at workforce characteristics. The number of counselors is often used kind of as a proxy for how big an organization is. And then we looked at a typology of, of their arrangements regarding physicians. So this is lower than we would typically see, but that's because we're in this subsample, right? We're of programs that at baseline aren't offering MAT. So it's not particularly surprising that relatively few had a physician on staff. And then about 31% didn't have a physician on staff, but did at least have somebody on contract. And then about half n had neither one on contract nor on staff. And that's what we used as our reference category. But typically now, if you were looking at the full, s at the original sample, including the adopters and the non-adopters, you'd see this number 
would be more like 36, 37 percent rather than that high. Um, so we use that as the reference category. And indeed, having they may be a minority, but they are a mighty minority, that they were 6.3 times more likely to adopt MAT over time if they did have that position on staff. At baseline, yeah. So that that was kind of an early indicator that we are moving in that direction, folks. Um, in contrast, this having a physician on contract at baseline was not associated with adoption over time, um, and so we're still we can we're still kind of looking at that group because certainly, you know, that's going to cost organizations less money to have somebody on contract. Um, but we haven't found great evidence that that's enough, really, to push folks um, into adoption over time. Um, the counselor measure was not significant. And then we looked at sources, of two kinds of funding. We looked at Medicaid funding. Um, and then we looked at other public funding, which is the state contract, criminal justice, county funds, all the rest. And this is what you would expect based on how we sampled, that about two-thirds of their patients are paying for treatment with those kinds of funds, and that relatively few are, pay, um, are having their treatment paid via Medicaid. What's interesting is that this other public funding was not associated with adoption over time, but that the Medicaid, they may be few, but it did matter over time, and that that was also um, positively associated with the odds of adoption over time. And then lastly, we asked some questions about where do you get information about innovations? Um, and so the two kinds that we looked at here were um, sort of direct marketing, typically like phone calls and office visits, those kind of detailing activities by pharmaceutical companies, and then getting information from NIDA's website, SAMHSA's website, and those kind of more static sources of information. Um, and these were measured on a zero to five scale. Here, the one tells you, as you might imagine, they don't have docs. They're not getting a lot of detailing by pharmaceutical companies. However, that was positively associated. That baseline measure of detailing was actually associated with whether or not five years later they were offering MAT. Um, the federal sources, sadly to say, were not significant. I think what this is actually kind of pointing to is that as we think about dissemination, um, you know, social networks, it's, it's about person-to-person -person kinds of things and organization-to-organization. Organization. I used to actually do some of the face-to-face -face interviews, and it was amazing to look at organizations that talked about, well, you know, we started doing this because the center down the street started offering this medication, um, or we started to get the information, we had a visit from the pharmaceutical company, um, and that that, you know, rather sort of, we would love, I think, for the websites to be effective, but they're just, it's it's not enough. And, we, and you know that it's going to take, obviously, resources and money, particularly for medications, to do those kinds of interventions. So we saw, you know, a minority, about a quarter, adopted MAT over time. We found continued evidence that medical resources matter. That's not surprising. But I think the contribution here about Medicaid has important implications, particularly as we watch the changes um, with health reform. And then thinking about I mean, I don't know necessarily that it's about pharmaceutical companies per se, but I do think it's something about active methods of transmitting information that build on relationships rather than just passive, we're going to throw the manuals up on the website and hope for the best. So last, the last study I want to talk about is um, some work we've done on implementation of pharmacotherapy for opioid use disorders. So these data are from an earlier paper where we compared publicly and funded treatment and privately funded. And I just really wanted to, to throw this one up there to make you sort of see that the privately funded sector is not all that different than the publicly funded organizations. And so while we'd had a fair number of um, papers published looking at availability, there were relatively few studies really looking at the percentage of patients that are receiving medications. So that was our interest here. So first we wanted to measure, and then, is, and then really we were interested in sort of the sources of funding, and does that, those government sources and private insurance, what, does that have um, any relationship with the percentage of patients that are receiving these medications? And to take it just a brief step back, I tried to not have too many theory sli <laughs> slides, <laughs> um, but here we're drawing on resource dependence theory, which argues that you know, organizations will make decisions based on where they get their resources from. And so we know, we've, there's publications that have talked about, you know, criminal justice, 
historically not particularly supportive of medication assisted treatment. So we wouldn't really expect those programs that are more reliant on that source of funding to be um, using a lot of pharmacotherapy. But the Medicaid formularies, while they vary a bit um, in what they include, um, based on our prior work, we thought that was one direction that might help promote implementation. And so these data come from um, NIDA's Clinical Trials Network. Um, and y'all, y'all are part of it, so you know that you've got this partnership between community-based treatment organizations and university-based researchers and lots of multi-site clinical trials happening in those set settings. And when you look nationally at the composition of the CTN, we really see the full range of treatment programs represented there. So we've got outpatient programs, the residential and therapeutic communities. There's a few hospital inpatient programs, or at least they were when these data were collected, and then also um, some methadone programs that are in that, in that system. So here we collected face-to-face -face interview data from administrators. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we've got our usual criteria of offering at least structured outpatient, but we did know that there were some method, the methadone programs, and in fact, there are 42 programs that all they do is methadone, and at 100%, you don't really have any variability there, so, because MAT is sort of their reason to exist. So, in this analysis, we really were focused on organizations that look much more like that publicly funded sample, so they are um, not exclusively um, delivering uh, treatment, opioid treatment. And so to define, to create our measure of implementation, we looked at what at the time were the three medications. So we looked at buprenorphine, tablet naltrexone, and we did include programs that had methadone if they were doing other stuff in that agency. Um, and so for, we asked about each medication specifically. If they were, if that medication was not available at all, they got a zero on this measure. If it was available, then we asked about the percentage of their opioid use disorder patients that were actually receiving each of those medications. So at the time, um, Vivitrol hadn't been approved, which is why it's not included here for opioid disorders. And then we summed them to get our overall implementation measure of what percentage of patients are receiving these three medications. And then we asked about sort of the six types of funding that I've alluded to earlier. Um, and these questions we actually sent in advance because we knew that these were harder questions to answer. They may require looking at financial records and so forth. And we controlled for a variety of organizational structure and workforce variables as well. So what do the programs in the CTN look like? They actually look, in many ways, like our publicly funded sample. Um, a relatively small percentage are hospital-based. That was very true in the public center sample as well. Relatively low percentage of for-profit. This is, I mean, a tiny bit higher, but it's that much higher than sort of the outpatient only, I think was more like 40% in the publicly funded sample. Where we do see some difference, so their average of the number of physicians on staff is almost to one. Um, in contrast, the public data I showed you was more like half, so um, more medical resources there, but actually these characteristics are fairly similar in terms of the percentage of counselors who have a master's degree and the percentage of counselors who are in recovery. And I've alluded to, you know, that programs get their money from all over. And this is mostly just to highlight that, that here are the means and the standard deviations. You know, Medicaid, average center got about 19%. 23% of funding came from state government contracts. You'll see that the standard deviations are all really pretty large, which is also pointing to quite a bit of variability within the data. So let's talk about implementation. When we look at the 156 programs, setting aside the methadone ones, and look at the average rate of MAT implementation, we saw 9.6% of their opioid patients were receiving pharmacotherapy. Now, in large part, that's influenced by the three quarters of centers that aren't using MAT for any of these patients. Um, if you restrict your analysis to just looking at those that have MAT available, then the implementation rate is higher. You're up to 40% of those patients. Yeah, and Thomas shaking his head, I mean, because <laughs> that means there's really a sizable number who are still, even in those programs, not receiving pharmacotherapy. So my first thought was, well, is it just that those patients aren't there? Is that really the ex explanation? And I think it, the answer is no. So we had one of the 156 programs that had no patients with an opioid diagnosis. Um, so we don't, we can't explain it away that way. So we ran a series of multivariate models. 
looking at implementation. And we looked at each of the six sources of funding separately because they're percentages. So like a change in one is going to affect the other um, while controlling for workforce and organizational characteristics in each of the models. And the two that were significant in the multivariate models were Medicaid and criminal justice. And they confirmed our hypotheses that indeed um, centers that were more reliant on Medicaid revenues had higher rates of MAT implementation. Um, when you look at these kind of percentage odd ratios, they always look tiny. So, but if you think in terms of a standard deviation increase, which I think is about 22 percentage points, you would see essentially a doubling of the expected um, rate of implementation. In contrast, um, that criminal justice funding, again, consistent with our hypothesis, for a standard deviation increase in the criminal justice funding, which was about 14 percentage points, we saw that rate of implementation cut in half. I mean, we're still talking about relatively small percentages, go back to the 9.6% of patients, but nonetheless, um, it's starting to give us some hints, particularly in the, you know, as we move with health reform forward, of some possibly optimistic thoughts about what might happen. The other four kinds of funding were not significant. So, consistent with the spoiler alert given like <laughs> at the very beginning of this, um, you know, the research to practice gap certainly remains. Um, if we go way back to the original slides about psychosocial interventions, it was true for those, and it remains true for medication-assisted treatment. The, the story still sort of remains about limited availability, modest change over time, um, but fairly low implementation. And we actually have a new paper looking at a campersate implementation that tells a very similar story that something, uh, it was around 7 percentage of alcohol patients um, at the time of the interview were receiving a campersate. Um, but certainly, you know, some of these measures that are indicative of medicalization um, of substance use disorders, particularly the access to physicians, is critical but remains fairly limited. And then kind of some mixed evidence about whether the ways that we're thinking about disseminating information is really um, working, if you will. But on the one hand, you know, in the adoption data that I showed you, sort of the perceived support as well as awareness about p state policies um, were positively correlated with availability. You know, the federal efforts, not so much. <laughs> the pharmaceutical detailing um, was important um, in terms of availability and adoption, um, and that a campersate paper found a very similar kind of finding, and so we find it for specific medications as well as any MAT. Where am I at time-wise? 15, 15 minutes. I'm happy to take questions, or I can show you two to three slides about some of the new stuff we're doing. New, new stuff. All right. <laughs> Here we go. So what's next? Um, well, I'm really excited because we just uh, last year got a new study funded to look at buprenorphine implementation from the perspective of physicians. That has always been kind of what I think is the missing piece of the portfolio of research that we're doing. Um, and we're going to use a mix of methods here, actually. We've just started recruiting a large nationally representative sample of physicians who hold the X license. And we're restricting our sampling to those who have um, at least one patient currently, because it's hard to measure implementation <laughs> for those that are not treating patients. So um, what's interesting so far, um, we've only been recruiting for about a month and a half. We're using the DEA X license database, because we know that the SAMHSA database is, shall we say, a little bit out of date based on our pilot work. And you have to volunteer to be in it. So it's not it doesn't include all the physicians that, ha that hold the X license. Um, but we're finding that about 40 to 45 percent of folks are not eligible to be in our study because they're not meeting that threshold of having at least one patient. Um, however, we still think that having the license is important. It actually gives us something we can track over time because the, the DEA publishes this database on a monthly basis. So we are, we're going to still do monthly counts to look at change over time. And in fact, we started doing that last, a year ago last May. So we have a little over a year's worth of data. And we found a, a rate of increase around 7% in terms of the numbers of ex-licensed physicians in the US. We all, then we went to the larger database. It was like, is that just the growth rate for physicians in general? The general rate is more about 
And so it is at least growing faster than the population of um, physicians, but um, is not growing at an enormous rate either. But what we're going to do with um, these, uh, with our sampled physicians, is we're using conjoint analysis to look at clinical decision making. And we're going to do four annual surveys, and each survey will be different in terms of what the conjoint vignettes do. So this first year, um, we're interested in looking at sort of the initial prescription decision, and we've created vignettes that include a variety of clinical characteristics about the patient, as well as how they're going to pay <laughs> for treatment, because we're interested in seeing whether sort of there's differences across Medicaid or paying out of pocket or having private insurance in terms of the likelihood that the uh, physician wants to prescribe to that patient, and also how much medication they're going to initially prescribe. And then we're also interested in the perceived impact of the Affordable Care Act. So we've, um, we did some pilot work with um, 20, we did qualitative interviews with 21 of the national experts that were part of what was the, P let's see, the, the, the support network of um, experts, and now it's transitioned, and I think it's either ASAM or the Addiction Psychiatry Organization has moved to a little bit broader platform about um, professional development and MAT, but um, we used those interviews to craft some items about the perceived impact of the Affordable Care Act. And we're going to ultimately do multi-level models to link the physician-level data along with some broader contextual measures. So we're drawing up upon a range of state-level indicators um, to look at how they structure, whether or not states are expanding Medicaid, how they structured their state health insurance exchange, as well as the demographics, um, socioeconomic demographics of the state, um, to look at sort of the linkages between those state policy factors, um, perceptions of the physicians, and then what the physicians report actually doing with patients. So their numbers of patients, how patients are paying for treatment, and then also sort of a range of clinical practice behaviors um, that help buprenorphine treatment be more effective and safe. But we've just started recruiting. But we're also interested though, like I said, about sort of the monthly Kate count data um, as sort of a little bit more objective measure of um, availability. And so we're working on converting that number into a sort of a population based, because obviously big states are going to have lots more um, physicians. And we're going to look at the state policy level variables about ACA structure and that count over time while controlling for other state characteristics. And so we've just started, these are data from December. Um, I was amazed, actually, at the extent to which there was regional variability. And maybe it's because I don't live in the Northeast. But <laughs> this, you know, up in the Northeast, there's 15 and a half ex-licensed physicians per 100,000 population. And the rates in the other region are half or less than half. Um, so there was more variability there than I was expecting. Um, and we've also started looking at, at least cross-sectionally, we linked um, the percentage of the state population covered by Medicaid to that population adjusted measure. And even after controlling for region and sort of the density of how many physicians just in general are in the state, as well as some indicators about substance use disorder treatment, the number of facilities per 100,000 and mental health spending per capita, um, we were working on a paper where we found that, that, that there's a positive correlation between the rate of buprenorphine wavered physicians and the percentage of the population covered by Medicaid, which is, again, you know, a kind of an, an early sign, maybe, that we will see some change over time. But because of, the state's, or because of the state's decisions and flexibility about expending Medicaid, yesterday's interesting developments, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, it all remains to be seen, sort of what the impact is. So I'm excited that we have this, that we'll be able to kind of track um, between now and 2018 what happens in this part of the treatment system. So thanks so much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions.